echoes of, of an Aristotelian view of nature. That, you know, that nature is, uh, is something that is targeted toward, to grow toward a particular end. Uh, and, and Gregory kind of likes that. That any, any created being, any created nature is targeted toward a goal. Uh, the, the, the problem is always that we, we turn nature, just like we see it, into a sort of abstract philosophical or metaphysical concept. And I think, I think Gregory understands you, 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 you can do that. In fact, you have to, at a certain level, talk about creative nature as a philosophical and metaphysical reality. You know, we're talking about something that's, that's an objective reality. But the more important thing is that nature is, you know, if we're talking about creative nature you know, broadly or individual creative nature, a nature is really sort of the theater of God's action within the horizon and trajectory of a creature's development. Uh, Hans Urs von Baldessar, a great Catholic theologian who was a big fan of Gregory Nyssa and wrote a book on him. He says, you know, for Gregory Nyssa, nature is, is primarily a field of movement, a field of positive emotion. It, let me use a good colloquial. It's a game plan in a sense in which the, the creator is targeting a creature toward a particular goal and hanging in there with that creature to arrive at that. Okay? <clears throat> now, uh, Gregory can, I mean, for example, in, in, the, in his treatise on the creation of humanity, Gregory says that human nature created in the image of God is like one human being. He calls it the fullness of humanity. Okay. We're, we're all sort of bundled. Uh, in human nature, we're all sort of bundled as, as one human nature. Okay. We all are instantiations of that nature in our particular you know, persons. But um, uh, there's a certain original perfection for that. Um, and, you know, as human beings who share in this nature, we are projected toward a goal that is given to our nature. The problem is, if you look at the history of the human race, look at all the different variations <laughs> uh, of, of uh, personalities and all the different trajectories of those persons toward the realization and fulfillment of that goal. Uh, Johannes Zockhuber, who's a uh, professor at Oxford and uh, who's written on Gregory and has written a big book on Gregory's theological anthropology. He says, in that book, he says, you know, I wonder if, if Gregory is aware that given his concept of nature as a sort of perfect whole, how is it really possible then for anybody, any individual human being, including Adam, really to violate that nature? To, to deviate from it? And, so, and, um, and I think the answer lies in the fact that nature for Gregory is still sort of a rubbery concept. I, I, think, he, I think he wants to see that the Creator always holds all the cards. The Creator always has the freedom, the <coughs> options to not so much alter the nature, but to shape it so that it can survive things like the Great Fall, you know, the Adonic collapse of humanity. So Don, nature is a very dynamic concept in Gregory. That's why I like 
I think that's one thing that the Orthodox tradition has to offer to the West, which got so caught on the dialectic of nature and grace. Aquinas was hooked on that. Augustine was hooked on it. Much of later Western theology has been addicted to that basic dialectic of nature and grace. Whereas in the Eastern tradition, owing uh, in no small measure to Gregor Nyssa, nature is already intrinsically graced. Nature has a sort of malleability, a sort of flexibility uh, to, uh, I guess you could call it adaptability, through the imminence of God's grace. And I think that's where Gregory is going with his understanding, particularly of human nature, because that's the, that's the preeminent.